Welcome to Next Round with the Pacific Research Institute. I'm your host, Romina Ichon. Tim and I are PRI Senior Director of Communications, and I had a conversation with our colleague, PRI Fellow in Legal Studies, Eric Jaffe. Eric, a partner at Shara Jaffe and a constitutional attorney, has been involved in over 100 Supreme Court cases. We discuss with Eric some of the U.S. Supreme Court's decisions involving COVID-19, the big cases in this session including LGBTQ rights, DACA and the Dreamers, abortion, and President Trump's personal financial records. Finally, it's been a while since we've asked for wine recommendations, so get your pen out because Eric's a big wine enthusiast. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to PRI's Next Round Podcast, Eric. Before we get into the weeds on the Supreme Court cases, let's talk about the kind of year the courts had. Uh, Last October, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg announced that she had another bout with cancer. And then in January, Chief Justice John Roberts presided over the impeachment hearings of Donald Trump. Then just when the court was getting back in the groove, COVID-19 struck and prompted the justices to do something that they've actually never done before, which is to hear cases by telephone and let the public listen in. So you were a clerk for Justice Clarence Thomas. Give us your perspective on the kind of year the Supreme Court has had. Well, I'll say that it's certainly been a a atypical year. Uh, But for all of that, I think there are some interesting high points to it. Starting with some of the less high points, obviously, Justice Ginsburg having further health issues is is a low point for the court. But I will say that she is a tank. She has taken the hits and keeps on going. To to look at her, you might think she is frail. I actually think she is indomitable. Uh, And so uh, whatever her health and the doctors throw at her, I have full confidence in her ability to bounce back. Uh, Last I heard, she was still working out at the court, even in the face of COVID risks. So kudos to her, and uh, we uh, obviously hope for her continued health. As for the impeachment stuff, uh, I'm sure that was a great distraction, uh, perhaps to the court in general, but certainly for the chief justice, particularly for a a chief justice who I think is very concerned about the court staying out of sort of these kinds of institutional battles and who really prefers the court's independence and reputation sort of stay above the fray. That could have been a pleasant experience to sort of be drawn into the most political of fights. Uh, but I think he acquitted himself well in, in you know, so, sort of playing the role of the referee, as he described his role during his uh, confirmation hearings. And so whatever you think of the impeachment proceedings in general, uh, I, I don't think you can fairly criticize the chief justice's handling of them. And I'm sure he's happy to be back to his day job. As for the telephone stuff, the telephone hearings, I think that is one of the highlights of the year. Uh, it's actually an interesting counterpoint to the way arguments usually happen, which is a bit of a, a mad scrum to get questions in. Uh, and I've, I've sometimes described it as sort of a, a tennis match or a volleyball match where the justices sort of bounce the ball off the head of the attorney and see if one of their uh, disagreeing colleagues can return the volley. Uh, and, you know, the poor attorney sits there just getting balls bounced off their head without necessarily having much chance to get their own point in. Under the telephone version, I think both the attorneys and some of the less active justices are actually being given an opportunity to show a different way that oral argument can proceed, which is with detailed questions, detailed answers, and thoughtful follow-ups. And I think that's a to a great degree a function of the format and a function of the chief justice being, I think, quite good in his handling as traffic cop, basically, of making sure people have time to ask their questions and answer them, but not letting folks run on forever. And I think he's done a good job of balancing that. I'm sure over time, if it continues in this format, he will, in fact, get better and better at that. I think he's done quite a good job. And the most obvious consequence that you see is the many more questions by Justice Thomas, who I think this format suits him quite well. And he's the most senior other than the chief, so he gets to go first. So so not surprisingly to many of us, you're starting to hear him ask questions that might not have gotten asked in a different format that he's repeatedly expressed his dislike for in public. So there you go. In terms of what kind of year it is, I think it's been challenging. Uh, I think there's been some high notes. I, I think the fact that they didn't get through all of this term's cases is probably a source of stress to many of them. The court has traditionally liked 
to get its work done and completed by the end of June. And obviously, a bunch of cases had to be pushed off into next term's argument schedule. Uh, and so I'm sure no one is thrilled by that. But it was sort of a necessary accommodation as people sorted out how to do arguments in the best manner possible. Uh, and so I'm sure they'll work through that as well. Eric, the court made some big rulings related to the coronavirus pandemic. One of uh, the cases that was of particular interest here in California is an appeal that was brought by a San Diego church that challenged the state's limits on large church gatherings. And the church argued that the state's rules infringed upon religious freedom. A sharply divided Supreme Court rejected the church's challenge. And the justices, by a 5-4 to four vote, said that California could enforce its rules at least for now. Chief Justice Roberts joined the courts for liberal justices in upholding the state's rules. Why did the court reject this appeal? There is an incredibly narrow disagreement between the majority, or at least Chief Justice Roberts' opinion, and the dissent. And that disagreement is whether or not churches are being treated in a comparable fashion to similar other institutions, non-religious institutions. Roberts thinks they are, the dissent thinks they are, are not. And the real fight is what's the right comparison group? If the comparison group is a is a barbershop, that's one answer. If the comparison group is a movie theater, that's another answer or a football game. And so I actually think the disagreement, at least on the, the, the substantive portion of the religious the religion clause questions, was, was quite narrow. And there is at least some support for either version of that. Uh, I think if, if one had scrutinized it very closely, churches were not being treated quite comparably to many institutions that were similar to them, particularly smaller churches, by the way. Whereas if you look at really big churches, perhaps they were being treated in a comparable fashion to large movie theaters or arena venues that would have concerts, let's say. And so you could sort of go either way. Uh, what I think ultimately determined it at the end of the day was this was a request for a preliminary injunction forbidding the enforcement of a health and safety rule. And that is a really big ask. You're asking a court to step in and override public health authorities in the midst of an admitted health crisis. And a court is going to be incredibly reluctant to do that. And Chief Justice Roberts, like I mentioned before, who was concerned with the court's institutional role and not becoming embroiled in politically heated battles, uh, is going to lean more towards saying that courts should not leap in before they've engaged in the full spectrum of litigation. And this was a very preliminary proceeding. So we didn't have all the evidence. We didn't have all the arguments. You had a very rushed argument. And based upon that rushed argument and that rushed record, he was asked to say definitively that they're going to win. And so because they're so likely to win, I'm going to let them win now while we sort it out. And that's a big ask for somebody who thinks the courts should take a more narrow role. I'm very sympathetic, by the way, to the dissent. I actually think this COVID authority has been deeply abused in a lot of states, and particularly in California. And I think it's important to look at what the proper constitutional standards are. And I'm not sure at the end of the day that they are as deferential as many courts and Chief Justice Roberts seem to think. But I am sympathetic to the notion that deciding these things at the preliminary injunction stage is really asking you to to leap first and look second. Well, Eric, you know, in another coronavirus related case, the Supreme Court refused to hear a request by the Trump Justice Department to block a judge's ruling ordering federal prison officials to take steps to move about 800 inmates out of a Ohio prison through compassionate release, home confinement, parole, or, or transfer to another facility. And in this facility, nine prisoners had already died from COVID-19. I'm sure that, you know, the public is sympathetic to the plight of these prisoners, but many are you know, scratching their heads wondering how law-abiding people like themselves are forced to stay at home, even face being arrested if they don't, while prisoners all over the country are being released. So what are your thoughts on that? So, so a couple things. So, so the, the first ruling where the Supreme Court declined to step in and stay the injunction uh, was actually more of a procedural problem than a substantive question. Uh, there had been an original 
original order, and then there had been an amended order, but there was only an appeal of the first one, not the second one, which added some modifications. And so I don't, I wouldn't read too much into that, particularly given that after the government turned around and, and then appealed the second order, uh, the Supreme Court, in, in fact, did grant the application for a stay. So they said, no, you can't suddenly force them to release or transfer everybody uh, until at least the government has had a chance to argue this in front of the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. And so the government then went, so the, the order was indeed stayed. Nobody got released. The government went in front of the Sixth Circuit, pointed out, by the way, that it was taking lots of steps to secure the safety of these prisoners, including transferring many of the most vulnerable to, to, to different facilities. And then at the end of the day, won the argument that they, they were likely to succeed on the merits, that the prisoners were not likely to succeed because this was not likely to be an Eighth Amendment violation. And the Sixth Circuit's opinion on this is quite interesting, mostly pointing out that, look, the government is not being insensitive to these, these serious concerns. It's taking a lot of steps. And if the answer is you don't think it's doing enough, that's not a constitutional violation. It has to be a real level of deliberate indifference, which I don't think anybody realistically could say the government demonstrated here. They might not have been doing the job you wish they were doing, but they were hardly indifferent. So at the end of the day, the answer is the government is taking a lot of steps to try to mitigate this problem. And the courts backed away and did not force the government to release anybody or to move anybody against what a, whatever their internal judgments would have been on how best to handle this problem. Now, I will say that I, I wouldn't be so quick to, to analogize this to you're letting prisoners out, but you're making people stay home. Because, of course, even had they let the prisoners out, they would have been confined to their homes just like anyone else and would have had an ankle monitor on to be sure that they stayed home. And in fact, many of the things the prisoners were asking were not to be let out, but to just be transferred to safer facilities that had better means of isolating some of the ones who couldn't be well isolated in this particular facility, which had, as you mentioned, had a particularly rough track record with COVID. I, I would at least point that out, that there's there's a bit of a, a miss analogy to, you know, citizens are being asked to stay home. Well, people are being asked to stay home because when you leave, you threaten the health and safety of others, not just yourself. And for prisoners, you're right. Some prisoners would have threatened the health and safety of others if they didn't stay home. But of course, then they would have been returned to jail. And, and keep in mind that this was a low security prison. The least dangerous criminals are at this. So it's not like we're letting out murderers, rapists and terrorists. Let's turn to the major court decisions this June. You know, perhaps the most controversial case this year is the case on whether federal employment law that bars discrimination based on sex includes claims based on sexual orientation and also gender identity. The court's ruling could confirm that LGBTQ people are protected against employment discrimination across the country. The case is particularly significant because it comes after Justice Anthony Kennedy long a champion of LGBTQ rights, is no longer on the court, and he's been replaced by Trump nominee Brett Kavanaugh, of course. So which way do you think this case will go? I actually think that there is a pretty respectable chance that it goes in favor of the LBG, LGBTQ litigants. Uh, and the reason I think that, I, I find this case actually quite fascinating, because it shows uh, sort of a divergence of originalist or textualist analysis of, in this case, statutes. Uh, obviously, in other cases, the Constitution, but here, of a statute. Uh, and the great example of this is to Justice Gorsuch, who looks at the text of the statute and basically says, look, it says on the basis of sex. And if these uh, litigants were doing exactly what they were doing, but were of a different sex, you'd have no problem. The only reason you have a problem is because of their sex. So if, if you, know, you have a, a male partner, that's great if you're a woman, but not okay if you're a man. The only difference is the gender of your other partner. Or if you, know, if you were dressing like a woman, didn't have the plumbing for that, then we wouldn't care. But the fact that you have male anatomy but are dressing like a woman, it seems to me that the objection isn't that we don't want people to wear dresses at all. 
It's that we don't want people with the wrong plumbing to wear dresses. So he makes, I think, during the oral argument in particular, he sort of poses some very difficult questions about how, if you just read the text of the statute, what its natural and, and in my mind, plain meaning is, how is it that this is not on the basis of sex, regardless of whether Congress contemplated its application in this manner? Uh, On the other side of that, of course, there was a great deal of skepticism that Congress could have possibly thought that this was what they were doing. And, And that may well be the case, that Congress never imagined that this is what it had enacted when it adopted this particular statute in these words. But you know, last I checked, I didn't care what Congress thought. I cared what they said. Uh, and I think if you're a, a, a die in the wall, die in the wall textualist, psychoanalyzing Congress or worried about what was in their heads at the time is the wrong inquiry. Their subjective purpose is not the question. Their objective statement of the law is actually what we enforce. Uh, so, so I think that there's at least a respectable chance that Gorsuch sticks to his textualist guns, decides that that's that's actually what this means, that this really is discrimination on the basis of sex, because if the complainant were of a different sex, they never would have had gotten fired. And we'll see where it goes. Look, maybe it goes that way and Congress changes the law. Maybe it goes that way and Congress strengthens the law to confirm that that's really what they want right now. Uh, I don't know which way it'll go, but, but I think it would be nice to see this have little to do with the social issue and more to do with what the actual words of the statute were. And I think on on that circumstance, the plaintiff's argument uh, is is anything but weak. In another hot case, the Trump Justice Department has asked the justices to allow the administration to end the Obama-era immigration program known as DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. The program shields hundreds of thousands of the children of illegal immigrants, known as DREAMers, from deportation and allows them to get work permits. Lower courts in our state, California, New York, and D.C. have blocked Trump from ending the program. Trump claims that Obama had never had the authority to implement it in the first place. Where do you think the court will land on this? You know, uh, I think it's close, but, but uh, you know, I lean in the direction of them allowing the administration to end DACA. And the reason I say that is because at the end of the day, the adoption of DACA was, was an exercise in prosecutorial discretion, if you will. It was a choice by the executive branch to, to not enforce a, a particular law to its fullest extent. And you see this happen all the time. We don't arrest people for every small violation of the law. We don't even arrest them for every big violation of the law if we think that there's a debatable reason or that we just don't have the resources to litigate it and we don't have a great chance of winning. There are all kinds of reasons that executive folks choose to under enforce laws. And as a good libertarian, you know, I'm at least, I don't want to discourage that. I don't want to force them to enforce every stupid law to the maximum degree. Not suggesting that, doc is, that that the immigration laws are stupid, but there are lots of other examples of that, obviously, of laws that are stupid. So given that the whole justification was we don't have the resources to fully enforce the immigration laws, so you got to draw the line somewhere. This is where we draw the line. I think that's an interesting exercise of discretion. Whether or not it complies with the statute is a different matter. But to the extent that it was adopted as a purported exercise of discretion, I don't really see how it can't be repealed as an exercise of discretion as well. So just because yesterday I decided to only enforce you know, 50% of the uh, petty thefts doesn't mean that tomorrow I can't decide I'm going to start enforcing more of them because uh, you know I think petty crime is now reducing the fabric of society or something like that. So the, the one thing I will say is that there's an interesting legal question here, which is about the reviewability of this action at all. So if this was truly a completely discretionary act, it's probably not reviewable by the courts at all. And I suspect the court will not go there. I suspect they will say it is at least reviewable for some things like compliance with constitutional requirements and, and, and things of that ilk. But whether they think it is reviewable entirely for how the agency decides to exercise its discretion and whether the Administrative Procedure Act forces an agency to jump through 50 hoops before it can ever exercise its discretion, I am very skeptical that there are five votes for that view. Uh, look, if, if, if there was some evidence that the discretion was being exercised in a way that violated the Constitution, so it was overtly discriminatory based on race, it was overtly discriminatory based on religion, perhaps that would be an enforceable standard to, to use. But if the only standard is, you didn't look at enough evidence, uh, you only gave me one sentence of explanation as to why you rejected their claims for, for, for you know, le- legislative grace, 
I find that very hard to imagine that the court is going to set itself and the lower courts up as arbiters of whether executive discretion <laughs> in, in something like prosecutions or non-prosecutions can be reviewed in that fashion. I would be skeptical of that being the result, and I would be skeptical of courts assuming that role. Another major case the court has heard is on abortion. The justices are ruling on a challenge to a Louisiana law requiring that abortion-performing doctors have the right to admit patients to a local hospital in what will be the first abortion case before the court since President Trump's two nominees tucked the bench. Now, you're involved in this case, so can you tell us a little bit about the issues that are involved in this case? Sure. So my firm uh, and I ha- represent the state of Louisiana. And while I don't want to really go into the how's it going to come out kind of stuff, I will say it presents a variety of interesting and difficult issues that I look forward to having the court at least clarify. So, for example, the Louisiana has raised a, a, a counter issue about standing and whether or not clinics can step in to challenge this law instead of having p- prospective patients step in and challenge this law. And that's a, a difficult problem because in other contexts, we might not allow that to happen. We have allowed that to happen in many abortion cases. But here you have the unusual situation of a law that is, is at least on its face described as trying to protect patients' health and safety against doctors who may be less qualified or have less ability to take care of them in the case of a Uh, something goes wrong. So needing admitting privileges and admitting privileges have multiple functions. And it's just unusual for a doctor to say, you can't regulate me and how qualified I am or how capable I am or the safety procedures I use, because that would make it more difficult for my patients to come and see me. Why, Why doesn't a doctor just challenge whether or not you even need an MD to perform an abortion or whether you need an MD to perform surgery of any sort. Because, of course, limiting the pool of doctors who do surgery to people with MDs reduces the supply and thus imposes some level of burden on people seeking those services. So it's a very odd situation about how much do we defer to states on general health legislation and health and safety standards versus recognizing that abortion has been protected to a different degree and therefore the burdens you would put on, say, getting, uh, you know, an operation on your foot uh, might be acceptable, whereas the same burdens on getting an abortion wouldn't be acceptable. Uh, and recognizing that there's some difference there in the level of constitutional protection for those two activities. I find much of this to be very interesting to me on on the questions of deference and the questions of burdens of proof. To what burden of proof do we put the state uh, about w- what their need is? To what burden of proof do we put the plaintiffs as to what level of imposition it will be and how much more difficult it will be to get an abortion? Uh, on what level of proof do we put doctors to say they can or can't comply with this or have or haven't even tried to comply with this? These are all fascinating questions that come up in the abortion context, but also quite frankly, come up in lots of contexts. Uh, and the simple comparison would be, go look at a Second Amendment case. And when California turns around and says, you know, we have all these rules about making you jump through 50 hoops to go get a pistol, and we say that this is our interest, but we just wave our hand and pretend that that's our interest, you know, there's a sort of an interesting equal and opposite set of claims. A Second Amendment advocates say that California is just making this stuff up in order to burden the Second Amendment. Abortion advocates say the states are just making this stuff up in order to burden abortion. Uh, And you will find very different standards applied in those two contexts, depending on where you are. So it'd be nice for the court to step in and at least try to bring some uniformity to how we address constitutional issues and claims of constitutional rights and claims of a public health and safety need weighing against those constitutional rights. So I I find the questions fascinating, important, and uh, I'll leave it at that. We'll see what the court does. Eric, in in another high-profile case concerns a President Trump's own personal financial records. So Trump has asked the court to let him keep a variety of tax records, including his tax returns, shielded from Congress and an investigation by a a Manhattan DA. While the cases aren't about whether those records should be available to the public, they could shed some light on whether voters are ever likely to see those documents. Where do you think the court will land on this? Well, I don't see a scenario where the court says these entities can never get these documents. So if the question is about whether 
the public ever gets to see them, uh, I suspect eventually that may happen. Uh, Though, even if the DA or Congress gets those records, it's not at all clear to me that they're entitled to release them to the public. There are all kinds of privacy laws dealing with tax returns. Now, uh, anybody who pays attention understands that there's going to be a leak and it's going to come out, probably, because that's the way the world works. But that would probably be illegal uh, in a lot of situations. Uh, as for the whether or not Congress or the DA gets to see these things, uh, I think there are two different problems. I think that Congress arguably has a harder road to hoe than the DA does. So Congress, I think uh, everyone agreed in the arguments and in the briefs, has at least some degree of subpoena power that's implied in its ability to perform its functions of passing legislation and, and whatnot. It's just a question of what degree. And given that there's not a really great express constitutional authority for that kind of stuff, that's sort of up in the air a little bit. And there is a serious concern about weaponizing subpoena power. And for folks who don't think that that's what's going on here and or don't you know think that this is just reasonable, I would point them back to prior uh, administrations that made the same argument that subpoena powers and investigation were being weaponized. All you have to think of is Benghazi and any number of other things in the Obama administration. And, and I would say that this is not, the o- the overarching issue is not a partisan question, even though the application in this instance may be, and certainly has devolved into a partisan question. But, but that being said, I think the court was quite skeptical about Congress using subpoenas uh, on, against sitting presidents as a tool for making the president's life more difficult, particularly where those subpoenas don't necessarily relate to the president's performance of his official duties. They're relating to some private stuff before. Uh, and so so I would be skeptical of the court giving Congress carte blanche. I would be equally skeptical that they'll say it could never happen. But my guess is that they will adopt some rules that fairly narrow the range of when Congress can ask for records that don't fairly directly relate to existing legislation uh, or you know, pending legislation or, more importantly, to the president's performance of his duties in office. I think the state authorities are in a very different situation. So their requests for tax information information uh, strikes me as right down the heart of their enforcement power on all sorts of state law. And so they have a more self-evident claim. They clearly have authority to subpoena records from private parties. Remember, many of these subpoenas are being issued against accountants and other banks, not against the president himself. So it would be odd that the president's immunity or temporary immunity would extend to all these private parties who Whatever you think the president may or may not have done, they might not unreasonably want to investigate whether those private parties conspired to perform bad behavior. You couple that with concerns for statutes of limitations and you know, perhaps deferring any such investigation for eight years. And I think the court is going to be more lenient in allowing state entities like that to get records that clearly relate to their law enforcement activities, uh, whether or not we think that they're also taking some pleasure in the fact that they're uh, doing this against someone they may not like. Absent some really serious evidence that this is a frivolous investigation with no purpose other than to harass, and it'd be hard to find such evidence. I'm guessing that the Manhattan DA and others will will, will get a, a a little more leeway and probably get a hold of these records. Eric, we've talked about the big cases here in our podcast today, but perhaps you could mention a couple of other cases that might not get the media attention they deserve, but could have widespread impact on the public. I think that there are a number of cases that are certainly interesting. Whether or not they'll have widespread impact may remain to be seen, but uh, let's start with uh, an odd case that got decided recently uh, called uh, the Maine Community Health uh, Options versus the United States, which was indirectly about Obamacare. So when Obamacare got passed, the federal government promised to pay insurers a certain amount of money if they faced a bunch of losses, and insurers promised to pay the government a certain amount of money if they made some profits above a certain degree. And it's called the Risk Corridor Program. Uh, and this sort of promise was made in legislation. Uh, and then afterwards, Congress decided not to fund any of that and not to pay what it had said it was going to pay. So it basically reneged on its its statutory promise after the insurance companies had already done what they were supposed to do. And the Supreme Court ultimately agreed with the insurance companies that Congress doesn't get to renege on that. And when you have a statute that clearly promises to pay you money, that promise is binding. Uh, I thought that was exactly the right answer. 
And while I don't know that I much care about the impact in, in this particular case, it does come up in other contexts where Congress plays a bait and switch, where they put stuff in legislation that is expressly designed to get people to do things. People do things and then they say, ha ha, now we're not going to pay you. This happened uh, in a variety of instances. It happened once upon a time uh, in the bank, in the savings and loan crisis, where they made a bunch of banks take over really lousy assets on a promise that they could amortize those over a bunch of years. And then lo and behold, they said, sorry, you have to amortize them all today. And guess what? You're bankrupt now. Ha <laughs> ha. So you go out of business too. Congress has a habit of not paying up on its promises. And that's a terrible, terrible habit to have if you want to actually contract with people at a reasonable price, whether you want to treat people with reasonable respect. I mean, I think this would ultimately probably violate the Constitution if it, if it had gotten there, but it didn't. The court said, no, you made a promise. People get to sue to enforce that promise. And I think that will affect lots of businesses and indirectly affect the public and the public good in that Congress isn't suddenly treated as a unworthy partner that will have to charge six times the amount to because they, you know, half the time they, they cheat and don't pay up. So that's good. And that, I think that's a sort of a big structural thing that will affect lots of people, but maybe went under the radar for your average Joe. The insurance companies, of course, were watching this closely. Uh, another case that I think is interesting that would affect a lot of people is the court's treatment uh, of the New York State pistol and rifle uh, case. Uh, while they dismissed the case as moot because New York, of course, chickened out at the last moment, uh, shameless, shameless behavior on the part of New York. They spend years defending this law and then the Supreme Court takes it up and they say, oh, just kidding. We don't actually believe in that law. So we're just going to change it. And by the way, you can't get attorney's fees now because we changed it. You didn't win. Utterly, utterly shameless. Uh, shame on New York in every conceivable respect. But what was interesting was not the decision to let it go. Uh, that's a sort of a somewhat technical decision about what is and isn't moot. Uh, I suspect the dissent got the better of that. What, what I found more important was the three dissenters made very clear that they are growing quite weary of lower courts treating the Second Amendment uh, as a, an unwelcome guest and not giving it the seriousness it deserves. And even Justice Kavanaugh, who ultimately voted that the case was moot, agreed on the merits, and that, to the extent that it ever pans out, and there are a lot of other cases pending that the court could take, that will affect a lot of people in a lot of cases. Because so far, uh, no one has been taking the Second Amendment seriously, or not no one, but most courts have not been taking the Second Amendment seriously in the lower courts. And so it's time for the Supreme Court to let us know whether they really meant it in Heller and McDonald or whether they were just kidding. Um, hopefully they weren't kidding. Another case of interest is a case called Espinoza versus Montana Department of Revenue, which sort of deals with whether or not a neutral law providing aid to students violates the Constitution just because it allows students, it, it gives some aid to students who select to go to religious schools. Uh, I had thought we had resolved this long ago, that neutral programs can allow religious schools and religious students to participate uh, without violating the Establishment Clause. Apparently, Montana didn't get the message. So hopefully, uh, that case comes out and reaffirms the earlier issue. And I think that will help lots of people who may send their kids to religious schools, and that would be quite interesting. Uh, lastly, I would point out a case that you guys probably know about, a couple cases you guys know about. One is called uh, the Americans for Prosperity versus Becerra, a related case, or a similar case called the Institute for Free Speech versus Becerra, both of which involve challenges to California's demand for donor identity and donor information for all kinds of nonprofit groups. Uh, these, this, this behavior on the part of the California Attorney General uh, is a meaningful threat to privacy and free speech, it seems to me. PRI, of course, participated with the Project for Privacy and Surveillance Accountability in filing amicus briefs in both of those cases, which are at the cert petition stage, suggesting that this is a serious First Amendment problem. Uh, uh, and so hopefully the court will take one or both of those cases. Right now, those, the court has asked the federal government, the Solicitor General's office, to weigh in on it, on what it thinks about these cases. And we're waiting for an answer to, to at least one of those. I think it's asked in the AFP case. Uh, and hopefully the Solicitor General will say that the court should take the case up, that it really is a problem for government agents to start collecting donor information about people who are their, arguably their political enemies. Uh, and once again, for anyone who thinks that this is just about 
a partisan question of we don't like California collecting information on conservative donors, which is what they're doing. Remember that there are other government entities that can collect information on liberal donors uh, who you might not trust any more than the conservatives trust the California attorney general. Uh, one might even imagine that the federal government might be in such a, a, a position that could cause donors to, to liberal causes to be concerned at the moment if the federal government starts gathering such data, which, uh, uh, and certainly if it makes it available. Obviously, we see these kinds of fights in a lot of the privacy and surveillance uh, issues coming up today. But remember, the FBI was doing this a long time ago against its political opponents back in the civil rights days and back in the anti-communism days. And there's no reason to believe that any level of government under any administration of any political stripe would overlook such a tool for beating your opponents about the head and neck if it was made available to them without some kind of restriction. Finally, Eric, let's, let's talk some politics. The composition of the Supreme Court was a big selling point for Trump in the last presidential election. Do you think that the court's a more conservative lineup shifted in favor of a stricter interpretation of the Constitution? In other words, did Trump deliver on his word? And do you think the Supreme Court makeup will be a, another big issue in the upcoming campaign? So I, I think it's important to distinguish between uh, a more conservative court in the abstract versus a court that's more textualist or originalist, which is what I think we have moved in the direction of. I don't so so of the the new justices. Obviously, Justice Gorsuch has a, a, a very strong uh, inclination towards originalism, textualism, and sort of looking at the Constitution and, and indeed statutes, as we discussed earlier, uh, in that mode of analysis, which I happen to agree with. I happen to like that mode of analysis. So I'm quite pleased with that. Uh, Justice Kavanaugh, likewise, I think, is uh, probably more committed to that mode of analysis than perhaps uh, Justice Kennedy was in his day, but perhaps not to the same degree as Justice Gorsuch, though it remains to be seen. This is all early on in their tenures, and let's wait and see where they go. I would point out that that mode of judicial interpretation, that inclination, does not necessarily lead to conservative versus liberal outcomes. It's just a way of interpreting things. And sometimes it leads to a liberal outcome, as we, we may see with Justice Gorsuch's analysis of Title VII, of the anti-discrimination rules. He's taking a very conservative approach to looking at the text, which may lead to a very liberal outcome. Because I ultimately believe that these justices are not deciding based on policy preferences. They're de deciding based on judicial doctrines and judicial approaches on how they think courts ought to behave. Uh, so, so has Trump succeeded in creating a more conservative court, more originalism? Though some of the liberal justices are now embracing originalism, like Lana Kagan, and I think she does a, res a very respectable job of in that mode of analysis. Uh, and it, I think it highlights the fact that originalism doesn't necessarily lean towards one or the other answer, that even under originalist mode of analysis, there are lots of disagreements. There are lots of textual disagreements about what words mean. And so has he succeeded? He has succeeded in giving a different flavor of judge that has a different mode of judicial analysis. What impact that has on the court in terms of sort of colloquial conservatism versus liberalism? I think we should really wait and see. We might be surprised on both sides as to where those modes of analysis lead us. As to whether it has a, it's an issue in upcoming campaigns, I think it will be less of an issue than it was the first time. There's a five justice majority right now, and while some conservatives occasionally squawk about Justice Roberts, he's still fairly conservative, it seems to me, and even though he occasionally switches sides, uh, I don't view that as as suggesting a necessary abandonment of his mode of analysis, just that sometimes different people can reasonably disagree where that analysis leads. Uh, I think we have so many other issues right now that will drive the election that the court will become a lesser driving force in November than, say, some of the social issues we're seeing today, some of the criticisms of the president on a personal level, uh, on a judgment level. I think those things will probably take a bigger role to the policy debate about the court. Finally, we've saved our best question for last. We ask every next round guest to give our listeners a wine, beer, or cocktail recommendation, hence the name of our podcast, Next Round. Now, we know you're a foodie as well as a wine enthusiast, and I have my pen and paper out, so I'm ready to take some notes. What can you recommend to our listeners when celebrating or perhaps bemoaning the Supreme's decisions? Well, uh, I'll give you a number of suggestions starting with some of the 
sort of less expensive or mid-range ones uh, and moving up to some of the celebratory ones, uh, I guess. Uh, I don't know that I would drink the celebratory ones if I was bemoaning the outcome because it seems like you want to be in a festive state of mind to, to drink really good wine rather than waste, you know, if I was... If I was sad, I'd probably want to drink cheaper wine. But but there you go. So on the inexpensive side, but lovely for the summer, are a couple of rosés that I, I quite like. Both of them from California, actually. One is the B Sellers rosé, which is from up in uh, Napa, and that comes out. It's it's it doesn't. I don't think it's out yet for this year. But it's it's a spectacular rosé, very modestly priced. So it's really accessible wine from an extremely good producer, uh, and I would strongly. Strongly recommend that I'm going to buy a ton of it as soon as they they release it. The other I would suggest is by a company called a producer called Rare Cat, which I, I every year get a case or two of. And again, I really like it. That's a a, a, diff, a different, a slightly lighter um, rosé, but I think it's a, a good. Again, not too expensive. Good drinking for summer if you want to bemoan or celebrate events now. Not a lot to celebrate at the moment, I imagine. But if you want to be refreshed in your backyard now. Perhaps do that. In terms of whites, on a sort of a somewhat higher level, if you like white wines, uh, I personally am a huge fan of certain French wines called Contrues. And I think one of the really reliable producers is a producer called Gigal, G-U-I-G-A-L, that their standard Condru, they're just their normal domain level Condru. It's about 60 bucks a bottle. It's it's really excellent. Uh, Condru is a, uh, a, a an area that produces only Viognier, and it's, it's probably the best expression of Viognier, Viognier you'll ever taste. Moving back to, to California, uh, I would, for Chardonnays, which I think often get a bad rap, uh, I think one of the best Chardonnays you can get right now, uh, certainly American Chardonnays you can get, is Kistler. And Kistler makes a whole bunch of different sub vineyards, you know, different vineyards and different expressions of it, all of which I, I think are spectacular. Again, a little bit on the higher price point side, a little bit more expensive than that Gigal, but coming out of uh, California, it should be able to track some of it down and is really one of the best expressions of Chardonnay you'll see from California. Finally, moving on to whites, uh, I've been leaning towards sort of nicer, bigger, more celebratory, I'm sorry, reds, uh, celebratory Reds. It was my anniversary recently. We had Mother's Day recently. I'll start with a couple of the easier ones uh, and then move to the top of the ones that I've been looking at. Uh, there's a great Spanish Red from Bodegas Muga, M-U-G-A, called Gran Reserva Prado Inia. Only comes out every few years. It's the best of the best of their reservas. I have a bunch of the two, 2010 in my house and it's drinking beautifully. Uh, and you should be able to find that in a variety of places, at wine stores or online. If not 2010, one of the other years, I think 11 may have been another special year that came out. A second one, again, from France. I've been sort of favoring the Rhone lately. There's a Chateau Neuf de Pop from a, a producer. They routinely make gorgeous versions of this wine. Uh, 2016 was a great year. It may be a little young, but if you can buy this, it's, uh, you know, you should be able to get it for under 100 bucks a bottle at retail. Uh, and it's a great example of this wine, big, thick, you know, big, big, bold Chateauneuf de Pop. Finally, uh, the wine that I drank for my anniversary, uh, which I think is just eye-openingly wonderful, is a Northern Rhone or mid mid-level Rhone, Hermitage, from a producer called Paul Jaboulet. It's their La Chapelle uh, Hermitage. Uh, again, it's their top of the line Hermitage. That one will be a little more expensive. <laughs> but boy, for a big event, if you can afford it, yeah, it was really quite amazing. <laughs> I was, uh, it was, it was eye openingly good example of a Northern Rhone wine. So there you have it. I know that's probably more than you want to hear on wines. Uh, and I'm hardly the expert on any of these. I'm sort of the, uh, an enthusiastic amateur, but that's what I've been drinking lately. So that's what I can sort of recommend. Thanks so much, Eric. This is terrific. All right. Well, thank you for having me on. I appreciate the opportunity to chat with you guys. Special thanks to Eric Jaffe and to Tim Anaya. If you like this episode, please tell your friends and subscribe to PRI's podcast at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or TuneIn. And please do us a favor and give us five stars. You can also listen to your podcast on PRI's YouTube page, youtube.com slash Pacific Research One. That's the number one. Thanks for listening. I'm Rowena Itchon. Hope you'll come back again for next round of PRI.